believe I asked for bagpipes, a set of pipes for Christmas when I was a little kid. <laughs> my parents thought I was absolutely off my head, but um, that's, that's kind of how it all happened. My mom went up and asked one of the pipers, does anybody teach? My son wants to learn. And it turned out that the man was from Bells Hill. You know, you're under the microscope because you're out there in the recording floor in the studio in a chair, oftentimes by yourself or maybe with the whole band. And there's all these faces looking at you through the glass uh, inside the control room, just expecting you to get it perfect every time. Thanks very much for joining us once again today and another interview, Piper's Persuasion. The date is Independence Day, 4th of July, 2023 in America. And say we're always independent or looking for independence in Scotland. But I hope we don't get it because I'm quite happy for it. That's the politics aside. Um, we have a, a wee treat for you uh, today. I'm saying uh, today because it's late afternoon here in uh, Britain and it's early morning in Los Angeles where we're speaking to Eric Regler. Uh, Eric has been uh, quoted as the most recorded piper in history. Uh, Eric, thanks very much for joining us. And, My pleasure, uh, Alan. It's very, very kind of you uh, to give us your time. Uh, we'll just get to the beginning of the conversation, you are American, uh, California, and understand that for some reason or another you started playing pipes about, say, seven years of age. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Uh, Ended up with a desire to, to play the pipes, you know. Um, I've got uh, Scottish and Irish background in my in my parents' history, but um, apart from that, uh, it was really the sound of the pipes when I heard as a baby that uh, made me want to play them. My father was a big music fan. He had massive vinyl record collection of classical music, jazz, big band, swing, and he happened to have a few pipe band albums, and they were actually Scots Guards and Black Watch and those kind of regimental uh band uh, albums and I, he would put them on every once in a while and and there was that sound again in my ears and i think i was just completely taken with the sound and that carried on till i was about five or so five or six and i believe i asked for bagpipes set of pipes for christmas when i was a little kid <laughs> my parents thought i was absolutely off my head but um that's that's kind of how it all happened that's excellent so who taught you? <clears throat> I think it went on for quite a while where we couldn't find an instructor. And uh, eventually, strangely enough, in my hometown, it must have been like an international days or some kind of a celebration at a specific sort of outdoor shopping mall. And um, <clears throat> I think they had like a Mexican mariachi band and different things. And then there was a pipe band in my own sort of backyard, if you will. So I was so thrilled and we were listening to them. And then when they took a short break, my mom went up and asked one of the pipers, does anybody teach my son wants to learn? And it turned out that the man was from Bells Hill. Uh, his name was John Massey. And uh, he um, took me on as a, a student and he was the pipe major of the band. And then, uh, there were a few Scots in the band, a few expats that were living in America. So I took lessons from him for a few years, um, actually a couple of years until he saw that I was moving along pretty quickly. And I also started at some point, probably three years into it, I'd heard of the Pirach or whatever the Pirach was. And, and I think my mom bought a couple of albums. It might've been a Donald McPherson vinyl record and a John Burgess album. and. I, I love the sound of that as well as, as, you know, the light music. So he passed me on to James McCall, Jimmy McCall, who was living here 
in LA and obviously had quite a reputation. It was difficult to get in as a student with him because he would only take advanced students. So he took me on eventually. And uh, then it was Jimmy that really kind of gave me the Pibrach and gave me a better understanding of competitive light music. It was the first Pibrach that you got from him. Mm. That's a good question. It might have been, uh, you know, the very first Pibrach I did get just before I got started with Jimmy McCall was uh, <clears throat> I was with the, um, went to the Seamus McNeil piping summer school that Seamus yeah. used to have every year here in California. So I finally went, I was pretty young, um, but I think it was the youngest kid at the entire summer camp. Um, but uh, I got a Pibrach then um, and it was the company's lament, which I think the college piping yeah. used to give out Aye. to all the students. And wow. then I think it was lament for Alistair Jarrig was the right. next one that they gave us. But, um, but that was a great, um, that was a great experience in a way going to that summer camp because John Burgess was there and Ian McFadgen and yeah. Seamus, of course. And, uh, you know, uh, John and, and Ian were really playing well still. That would have been probably in the mid seventies, maybe 1976 or so. So to hear them playing both the Pibrick and light music and all the, you know, the fancy, like John Burgess was, you know, doing his kitchen piping and yeah. it was just amazing, you know? So I think that was a huge bump for me to hear all that, you know, but then, yeah, Jimmy took me further. So. So when did you come to Scotland then uh, to, I, I know uh, from Kenny McLeod told me that you weren't here continuously, but just for a period of months at a time. Yeah. <clears throat> so I came, um, actually came when I was still in my final year of school. I would think I was 17 years old and I came over with, um, right at Christmas and Hogman A. Um, it, that was just a short little trip. It was my very first trip. And I came with another Piper friend of mine. Uh, at the time I was in the LA police pipe band. And uh, so it was a, the drum major of the band was a pretty well known character in Scotland. He was drum major, of the red hackle named George Brown. Uh, wow. And he so, yeah, so he was, um, he was from Troon. Uh, and uh, he knew everybody having been, you know, in the in the uh, the pipe band scene for many years um, himself before he emigrated to America. So we, we came over and he took us to a few pipe band practices. I think we went to the shots practice and we went to the uh, uh, Glasgow police practice, um, Edinburgh police practice. So we, we went to in a three week period, we. I got to see a lot of good piping, even though it was just sort of the beginning of the new year that year. It must have been 81, 1980, 81. <clears throat> and from that point, I was in my head, I was like, I, I'm going to come back. I want to come back. You know, I want to come back and stay. So I came back when I was 21. I was in the middle of uni and I just took time off and uh, I came over for about a year. And that would have been, it came at the end of 1984 through the the whole season of 1985. And uh, I was good friends with Harry McNulty and Harry had, uh, uh, well, I, you know, told him my favorite bands at the time were Shots and Dyke because they were my, had all the vinyl records and I was a little kid. Yeah. So yeah. it was Shots and Dyke And then at the time, Polkemic Colliery and uh, Boggall and Bathgate would have been my all time favorite bands at the, at the time. I thought their medley selections were just brilliant, you know, um, really in, innovative at the time. So I said, if there's any way I could get an introduction to play in a band for a year, any one of those bands would be my favorites. So he ended up uh, speaking to Tom McAllister and Tom invited me in to play with the band uh, that year in 1985. Tom had just stepped down. He had just had his run the year before. Where I think they won three of the majors that year in 1984 and then he stepped down um which i didn't know but anyway it was sandy bell pipe major sandy bell at the time and uh it was a great experience um it wasn't the best year for the band you know but um i learned a lot and i got to meet a lot of people you know i met just a lot of the other bands uh, i met both 
Gordon and Ian Duncan in the veil. And then I had met Ian McClellan of the police and Angus McClellan and, you know, the guy, some of the guys in the Edinburgh police, the Lothian and Borders band that were, you know, I knew through Harry and then the B Cal became good friends. A lot of the guys in the B Cal band, uh, I think my best friend at the time was Drew Duthert. So Drew, um, Drew obviously introduced me to his father, to Alec. And I ended up staying with them for about six weeks uh, at the beginning of that trip. So it was great. Every afternoon or evening, um, you know, Big Alec would say, right, get your chanter. And we'd have chanter and sticks and pad. And Bertie Barr would come over and Drew would get off work. And there'd be three uh, three drummers, you know, on their, on their sticks and pad. And then me on the practice chanter. We'd be playing everything, you know, Donald Cameron, Cameronian Rant, Pretty Mary, and all the old shots, tunes, because... By that point, I'd been get you know, I was learning the repertoire of the Shots Band, and I was, this would be like probably January, February of 1985, you know, so it was great. It was just, like, it was like a dream for me, you know, so that was the start of it all. So, uh, did you actually play with Strokes that particular season then? I did, yeah, I played the entire season with them, okay. and uh, I think the biggest uh, thing I can remember was just, the type of reed they were blowing at those, in those days was like <laughs> two lumps of wood tied together, you know? And, um, you know, I was a pretty strong kid, you know, six feet tall and, you know, pretty athletic and I, I could blow, but that was a whole other level of blowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, but it was, um, yeah, it was a good, I mean, it was a good experience. I got to, like I said, I met all the, many of the other bands and then that's when I met Rob, Rob Matheson and Ian Roddick, uh, Jim Kilpatrick, they were in the Polkemet band at the time. And, um, I think it was some tour, sometime toward the end of that year when, uh, Rab had asked me if I, if I was coming back the following year, if I'd play with the band. So that was a huge, uh, invitation for me. I was over the moon to do that. And that was a the year they did the album. Uh, from Celtic Roots that was quite a popular album at the time, you know, and uh, so, yeah, it was a great experience. So, yeah, I, I, I was Scott, I was in Scotland for about a year with shots, went home for a few months and then came back again for the better part of a year. And pretty much it was, a, I, I basically spent the next 10 years in Scotland off and on every year. I'd be coming over for the Highland Games, you know, for the solo piping, which I really got into around that time, 1986 or so is when I got into that. Did you go to Ronnie Morrison for lessons at that time? What tunes did you get from Ronnie? Gosh, um, he really got me going, you know, on the bigger tunes. And, uh, and then, you know, I think the first year with him, first year two, maybe I was sort of not even anywhere near the prize list. Right. Um, but it would have been tunes like, I would have started out getting tunes like, um, I think whatever the silver medal was on at the time, it would have been probably Donald of Lagan. Um, there was, uh, let's see, there was, um, I can't remember exactly the in the very beginning, but um, tunes like that, the, kind of the smaller tunes. And then uh, when I was, I think a couple of years later, I was getting into the, at least getting near the prize list and then getting into the prize list by the 19 late 1980s. I think it was 1988. I was second in the silver medal. But anyway, when I moved on from there to, um, to the bigger tunes, uh, praise of Morag, yeah. Patrick Ogg, mm -hmm. um, uh, the bicker, uh, the bicker was one that was one of the tunes I believe. And, um, I don't think I, I was second in the silver medal with that, but I think I was, fifth in the in the gold medal with that uh my first year in the gold i think it was 1989 or so uh, mm -hmm. i got in the very tail end of the prize list and then from there it went to uh the bells of perth and uh uh you know um unjust incarceration and uh the end of the great bridge um all the big ones you know as they're all big long tunes uh, they're excellent tunes my dear. yeah well enough, I went to Ronnie. He taught me my first beavers, uh, Ronnie and his brother Fred. Yeah. Oh, Fred. Uh, and uh, 
I, I learned an awful lot of tunes from Ronnie over the years with Octus House and Thornwood and Glasgow. Thornwood Gardens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I didn't like pipes in the house when I went to, it was all just practice chanter stuff, you know, but yeah. it was a fan of the, the music, uh, Venice's Borrelli. I thought that was yes. great phrasing of the tunes and all that sort of stuff. But uh, the first tune I ever got from was Tal Hard. Ah, uh, yeah. 16, I got that tune. In fact, I've just refurbished it very recently. I listened to Are You Brown playing it. Oh, no, yeah. he played it short and up and uh, yeah. with a bass, you know. But yeah. it's fascinating. Somebody you could speak all day about Peerus and that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, did you go to anybody else, like Angus McClellan or anything like that? I didn't go to Angus, but I became good friends with him when I was uh, later invited to teach at the College of Piping, um, both in Glasgow and uh, in California. Um, but we got yeah. to be good friends. Uh, no, the, the first year I was there, the year I was playing with Shots, is when I was I, I had been playing the in the solo piping back in California through my teenage years, you know, in the, in the juniors, yeah. and really, really in, big into it, but. I think when I first came to Scotland, the beginning, uh, the first year playing with shots was pipe band world was just yeah. fascinating for me and all the characters yeah. and all the people you meet, you know, so I didn't play solos that I might have played a few solos that year, but that year I got to be friends also uh, because of the B Cal band. I was good friends yeah. with them. Harry, Harry McNulty was the pipe major of the band. Big Alec was the lead and tip. Uh, and um uh, it was a uh, big Angus McDonald, pipe major Angus, who yeah. uh, maybe took a shining to me or, or something, you know, and we got to be friends. And he said, you know, come up to the house and uh, I'll give you some give you some tunes. I'll give you some lessons. And and that was massive for me because Angus was such a, a great oh, march player. Uh, yeah, a great, yeah. Day, absolutely perfect and an MSR and everything right through the whole discipline. You know, yeah, that's a guy too. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. Like you're very, very fortunate in the, uh, meeting these chaps and getting the, the right uh, way about your piping. Uh, yeah, did you actually play much with B Cal at all. I didn't compete with them, but uh, I did do a few of the famous uh, B Cal jobs that were around the world. You know, um, yeah. and that was cool. amazing. Yeah, it was just wonderful. You know, I, by that point, I was great pals with, I mean, in the band, there was uh, a lot of solo, great solo players. I got to be good friends with Alan McDonald, uh, Roddy yeah. McLeod, Ronnie McShannon, uh, Tom Johnson. Um, you know, there was there was just, a, of course, Ang Angus McDonald. There was just a, the characters were amazing in that <laughs> outfit, you know. But I was great pals with the drummers, too, you know, Eric yeah. Ward and... Uh, there was, um, of course, Big Alec, Jimmy Collins, um, Arthur Cook. You know, there was a whole bunch of great drummers. Yeah. And um, so uh, I, I kind of was uh, sometimes be at the back of the bus, leaving the Highland Games uh, with uh, in the B-Cal bus. I'd be at the back of the bus with the drummers, and then I'd move up toward the front of the bus and sit with the Piper friends of mine, you know. And um, But to, at that point, uh, I think they – trusted me well enough to invite me. So uh, I, I did uh, the very first year at the end of the season after playing with shots the whole year, went to France for three weeks with the BCAL uh, band. And that was just amazing. 21 years old. I had my 22nd birthday in, in France. And, uh, you know, to go ahead. that trip was um, that, that we were in several cities that yeah, were in Paris for uh, we were in Paris for about a week, and then we uh, the rest of the trip was down south. And, you know, the B-Cal in, in that time period, you know, we were staying in the nicest hotels and in the cities, you know. So we were down in Montpellier, Toulouse. Uh, we were in um, Cannes and Nice, and uh, it was hotels on the beach, and <laughs> it's unbelievable. Absolutely, yeah. Did, was it round about then that you started composing? Yeah, it was um, before that. I started writing tunes when I was probably in my teens. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably would have been st starting to write when I was probably about 15 or 16 years old. I started writing some tunes and then uh, just progressed from there. You know, I um, 
I, uh, I think, I don't even think any of the bands I played, uh, you know, I was playing with the LA police pipe band before I yeah. moved to Scotland when I was a teenager. Um, we never played any of them until I think, I think probably the first tune that was played by a major band, uh, would have been the field marshal when they played the B 52, um, and then I, follow I, that up with walking the plank. But, um, yeah, it was just something I did, you know, and I started giving tunes to friends and, you know, so I think that's how it all kind of got going. How did you uh, get into that? It always amazes me that somebody's got that mindset about composing. I could never get my head around that one. I could maybe explain that very briefly in the sense of two to the viewers. Yeah, it would have been, I would never, I don't think, I would never have thought like I want to be a composer or, or I never would have thought something like, I, I just wouldn't have been something I would have consciously said, this is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to write a tune. It was never, ever like that. I think as a kid, I used to just, you know, practice chanter in my mouth, in front of the telly, watching something on the telly and just absentmindedly playing on the chanter. Maybe I was playing a, a tune, a, a traditional tune, or maybe I was just making something up and not even realizing it. Just I think the chanter, you know, when you're a kid and, and you're into piping, the chanter is always in your hands. And I just think it just developed to where I started playing phrases that I, I liked and didn't even realize it. And then at some point, those phrases that I would make up would become a part of music maybe. And then from there, I would get inspired to write a second part of music um, really came completely, I guess, without me even thinking about it or trying to do anything to be a composer. I never even thought about that. It just sort of tunes it to start to kind of come out of me, I guess. We'll come back to the composing later on when we're talking about the films and recording yeah. and, and that. Hey, we won't touch on that again, but before we leave the Los Angeles Police Pipe Band, uh, perhaps uh, a wee mention about that. You're the pipe major, or you were the pipe major of the, the LAPD pipe band, and I uh, know that Kenny McLeod went across and played with yeah. you and all that sort of stuff. Uh, how long did that day uh, last? Uh, this? The band was historically the band in the recent times, I believe there was an LA police pipe band sometime in the earlier part of the 20th century at some point. I, I don't, can't really remember the history of that, but at some point it was reformed again in 1976 or 1977 uh, by a group of people who wanted the band to start again. Um, and they did get the support of the police department and uh, they got the support of some private donors who would donate money for the uniforms and things like that. So I, I was one of the original members of that reforming of the band in 1976, 77. Uh, so I was playing with them for a few years. And then when I moved to Scotland, that was the end of, you know, of that connection. I was pretty in, involved in, in my world in Scotland. Um, and uh, so the bands continued on through the 80s, but I had no connection with it. By the end of the 80s and early 90s, I think it had fallen away quite a bit. I think it was barely, I don't even know if it was even still going. And then I was approached by one of the, um, one of the police department liaison, he, he retired police officer who was in charge of the band, like band manager previously. He contacted me in 1993, I believe, and said, you know, we'd like to reform the band again. Would you take over as pipe major? And uh, it was a difficult decision because I was really involved in my time in Scotland then and playing in the solos in Scotland. So having, you know, responsibilities in the summertime when I be in Scotland and the summer contests are here in California was difficult. Um, I think to kind of imagine how I would do that. So I made an arrangement with them saying, look, I'm going to be, I can teach the band all year in the winter months, spring, come summer, I'm going to go to Scotland. But if my pipe sergeant can run the band while I'm over it doing the contest in, in Scotland, then I'll, I'll be back for the bigger contests. 
Um, so that's how we ran it. 19, I think we reformed it in 93. Uh, and then we competed in 93, 94, 95, 96. And Kenny had come over. I didn't, well, I think I invited Kenny or Kenny might have said, along with some other players uh, you know, that I knew in Scotland, hey, do you need any guest players? <laughs> and so they were keen to come across, you know. And Kenny really came across. He came and lived for a couple of years, you know, um, and he brought a couple of drummers with him. And um, you know, we had a great time. You know, it was a lot of fun. We had, I think, three or four, five Scottish players that were, you know, from the band, you know, Glasgow Sky Band. Yes. They had come over to play with us, you know. So uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and, and Kenny really enjoyed it here. I think he still has a fond uh, connection oh, with I, California. I love Sally. When did you start to learn to play the other instruments, the, the, the whistles and the Ulan pipes, for instance, small pipes? You know, that was pretty much 100% from my friendships of some of the players I knew in Scotland. Um, probably, I guess at the very beginning, probably would have been inspiration just from the music that my friends were listening to. And, and those friends would have been probably primarily Alan uh, and Ian McDonald from Glenuig, um, Dr. Angus as well. Although at that time when I was, this would have been 1986 or so, I think it was my second year there in Scotland, uh, Dr. Angus was living in Nova Scotia. I'd heard a lot about him, you know, but Ian and Alan became, I, I, I became good friends with them. And then my other, Good friends would have been would have been Gordon Duncan and uh, and Fred Morrison would have been friends of mine, you know, and um, very inspirational to me, you know, all of them. So when I would, um, you know, Alan had a flat in Glasgow at the time. Alan McDonald was in Deniston, and he shared it with Ian. And so I would pop over and sometimes spend a couple of days there, just sleeping on the couch, you know, and. Um, they would just put on the most amazing music in, in the evening. You know, we'd sit around and maybe have a couple of cans of beer and some, some of their friends would come over some of the folk musicians that they knew in Glasgow. And, uh, you know, we'd listen to, you know, the Bothy band and Planksty and some of the really seminal Irish groups. And then I remember them putting on, I remember Alan putting on a record by uh, Seamus Ennis, uh, famous Illin Piper uh, from, you know, the older generation. I was just so amazed. I, I mean, at that time, people probably don't realize now, now that we have the internet, we have every, anything we want to listen to at any time. The Scottish piping in Glasgow, let, I'm, I'll just say in Scotland and Glasgow, Edinburgh, it was really its own thing. The pipe band and the solo piping were very Scottish traditional music. Irish music, of course, was coming into it in jigs and things like that, but really there were, I think there was one Illin Piper in Glasgow, uh, yeah. one or two, and there was there was no sort of there was a very very small traditional scene. Of course, there was the you know uh, there was you know um, there was the Battlefield Band. There was uh, you know uh, the other bands at the time you know that were on the run um, and they'd be playing music sometimes. And I remember the Babbity Bowster in Glasgow used to have a. A uh, not very regular traditional music session, and and you know some of the some of the players would be in there. Ian McDonald would be in there playing his flute. Um, so at that point, it's really when I kind of was like, wow, there's a whole other world to, you know, the the world of music we're in. There's the piping, the the traditional Highland piping, pipe bands. Of course, there's the Scottish fiddle music, which I was listening to a bit, and some of the Scottish folk bands. But then, you know, there was the whole Irish world and uh, then the, uh, then they exposed me to the Breton music and yeah, you know, there was a whole world of Celtic music out there that I think, you know, in those days when there's vinyl albums were the only thing you had really, or somebody's cassette recording that yeah. they made somewhere, maybe in Lorient or they made it, you know, going to Ireland, but it really was so hard to hear things, you know, uh, and so anyway, that's when it started. And I think at that point in the, probably 1986, listening to, you know, Patty Keenan and, and Seamus Ennis and, and some of these players, uh, 
you know, that I, and Liam O'Flynn, when listening to these records at, at uh, Alan McDonald's house uh, flat, I was just like, I want to learn the Illin pipes. I, I think that was a, it. I was just like, I got to learn this. Well, how so did you go up that? that was difficult um, in many ways because the Illin pipes have really had a huge resurgence probably since the 90s, uh, both, you know, Ireland and Scotland. It's become more popular. Highland pipers are learning the Illin pipes. It, you know, it wasn't the case back then. Um, Fred wasn't even, Fred Morrison wasn't even playing the yep. Illin pipes. I remember at Celtic Connections uh, one year, probably 1996 or 97, meeting Patrick Mollart from uh, Brittany. And, um, you know, I was introduced to him. Of course, I was very familiar with his music and his bands that he had with his brother, Jackie. And I love the music there from, from uh, Brittany. And I remember Patrick saying, you know, it's just you and I, you and I are the only two that are really like have our Highland piping and the Illin pipe, like, piping at the, at like a higher level, you know, and, and it really was kind of strange at that time. There really weren't many players that played both pipes very well, you know, so, but getting to that point was difficult because getting a set of pipes was, was really hard. And I managed to get a practice set, which is basically a goose. It's just the chanter, the bag and the bellows. Once I got my hands on a set uh, of those, you know, and they weren't very great and the reed was not good. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, that's the reed, even the, in Highland piping, the reed is a huge situation. You want to have a great reed, of course, but it's even more crucial on the Illin pipes because if the instrument just won't even work if you yeah. can't get the reed to get the second octave, if it won't hit play certain notes properly or it can be wildly out of tune so i think from there i i, I struggled but i got by with a set mainly self-taught listening to records and and things uh like that recordings but um finally i got a good set of pipes i, I put put myself onto a waiting list from who i found was one of the best makers in the world at the time a man named alain fromont a breton guy living in kenmare in county yeah. Kerry. The interesting thing for the Irish that they had sort of they're celebrating the renaissance of uh, a couple of different pipe makers um, making really good sets of pipes or good instruments, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, after many, many years of the older pipe makers from the earlier part of the 20th century, Leo Rousam and some of the other makers like that were, of course, dying off and either handing it off to their sons or you know, the business off to another piper, but things dropped away for a good number of years in the, what I understand in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s until, you know, a lot of the newer pipe makers, Dave Williams, who was in England, Alain Fremont, who was based in, in County Kerry, really, and, and then um, uh, a couple other great makers as well. Uh, but so I managed to get on the, on the waiting list for Alain Fremont, uh, took a year and a half and got the set of pipes finally. And then, then it was like, wow, this is a different world. You know, everything's in tune. It plays so easily and well, not easily. <laughs> it's a difficult instrument, you know, yeah, but you, you've got the chanter, uh, which is difficult enough because the fingering is upside down in comparison to the, the Highland bagpipe. You have the three drones, which you can cope with, but then you've got other strange things called the uh, regulators. Yeah. And, uh, how did you manage all that? Did, uh, did you just pick it up yourself? Or what? I think, yeah, I managed on my own for a bit. And I remember being in California in the late 80s. I think it was before I got my proper set of pipes. Uh, I, I, had the, I had the goose, you know, the practice set. Liam O'Flynn came to California and he played uh, a series of concerts. He came to Los Angeles. I went and saw him and uh, I was just, he was a hero of mine. And I remember sticking around after the show to ask him a question about the pipes and I explained to him, I was just learning, you know, and I had a practice set and I was getting a set from Alain Fremont and he knew Alain very well. And so he said, well, the best advice I'd say is, come over in the summer to the uh, 
piping uh, summer school or the, the music summer school in Milltown Malbay in, in County Clare. It's called the Willie Clancy Week and it's a week long uh, music festival and there's you'll get piping tuition for a week. They teach the fiddle and the flute and concertina. They teach traditional instruments as well by well-known teachers. Uh, so I did that and I went over, I think I went over the first year I went over, I still had the practice set and it was just eye-opening. I got really good tuition. And then the following year I came over, picked up my new set of pipes and down in Cary, went up a few days later to Claire to the, to the festival. And then, uh, you know, I, I ended up going about four years in a row and um, I had just tremendous teachers, uh, Mick O'Brien and Ronan Brown and all the sort yep. of really well-known names in the, in the illin piping world. So that's when it, that's when I think things took off, you know, they taught me more about how to use the regulators and I yeah. was experimenting, you know, on my own. It was mainly listening to recordings and, and listening to what they were, the players were doing and imagining how to do it without actually knowing how to do it. Cause there was no piper in front of me showing me this is what you do, you know? So yeah, it was a struggle. You know, I really had to kind of figure it out on my own. And um, you know, if I, I don't even think there were, there was definitely hardly very few videos at the time uh, of piping on the Illin pipes. So uh, yeah, I just got by until I finally went to Ireland and saw how it Did was you really done. The whistles uh, the, on the, the, from the same people. The, uh, no, no, I, I kind of was later coming to the whistle. I was playing the whistle a little bit, but I think the pipes were just my fascination, you know? And of course, right. keeping up my Highland piping at the same time, which is really difficult, you know. Right. I think in the very beginning, I pick up one set of pipes and the brain would be thinking I'd be on another fingering, you know, I'd be on the, on the wrong fingering, you know. <laughs> so, a um, frequent conversation with Fred Morrison along the same lines, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, you know, um, and around that time when I got the Illin pipes, uh, I think I got the, got my full set in 91, but I'd been learning to operate the bellows, which was a big change for a Highland Piper. You know, you're pumping instead of blowing. Um, so I, I was on the bellows there for a few years and then, uh, you know, with the Illin pipes. And then I got a set of small pipes from Hamish Moore, who I really wanted to, uh, I thought his instruments were beautiful and so I got a great set from him. And at that point, I think once I've been on the Illin pipes for a few years and then, you know, jumped onto the small pipes at that point, and then was playing the whistle. Uh, and like I, you were asking, the, the whistle was self-taught. I just completely learned that by myself, you know, um, yeah. listening to recordings and, you know, just getting whatever I could from people in a way, you know, but. Uh, it's the same fingering as the Illin pipes though, isn't it? It's similar. It's ah. it's an the the whistle is like the flute. It's an open fingering, whereas yeah. you'd have more fingers open except for the note that you you're, you've got your finger on uh, or the closed finger. You know, the whistle would be more fingers open. Illin pipes, you'd have more fingers closed, and many ah. times only the note that you're playing uh -huh. would be open. There's other okay. combinations where you have a couple of notes open, you know, but so, yeah. So at any given time, once I got, you know, more proficient at the Illin pipes and the whistles, um, your brain would be jumping between three separate fingerings, Highland, fing Highland pipe fingering, whistle fingering and Illin pipe fingering, all pretty different. Although pipes and Illin pipes and whistles were similar, but still different, you know, so yeah, it was crazy. Um, but now I got to the point. Good job you're not a surgeon or something. <laughs> well, thankfully, yeah, that's for sure. But what at some you, point, it just be. What did you do for a living to earn money to do all this sort of stuff? It, not before it became professional uh, music. What did you work at? Well, I went to uni and had a degree in English literature. I wanted to go into filmmaking. That was the kind of path I was like, well, I couldn't get into film school right when I was in my first couple of years of uni. So I became an English major, but I snuck into every film class I could get into in university. And I was thinking I would go into that for 
graduate school and going to going to film school. And, um, you know, I, I just never ended up, I think Scotland got in the way that I came over and never, I finished uni, but I never went off to, uh, you know, to, to pursue my dreams in film. But, uh, while I was in high school and while I was in uni, I was, um, I've always been a, a surfer, you know, I've always been into surfing since I was a kid. And, um, so I got into making my own surfboards when I was, uh, probably 15 years old. So I'd make my own surfboards in my mom's garage, you know, and with all the resin and the fumes and the fiberglass and everything. But I learned to to make surfboards and I got really, really good at it. Um, eventually becoming like a professional, uh, f- like a, um, a production fiberglasser where in these surfboard factories, they'd have racks with 10 surfboard blanks or the core, the core, the foam core of the surfboard that the, the surfboard shaper or maker makes the foam core all by hand tools, planers and, you know, uh, saws and, and all this kind of stuff makes the, the shape of the surfboard. And then it moves to the fiberglasser and the fiberglasser then has to put the fiberglass cloth on it and then laminate it with the resin, the polyester resin, and then sand it and finish it and polish it out. It's, it's a lot of actually auto automotive, automotive detailing tools, like big disc sanders and things like that, you know, but I was always big into working with my hands. When I was a kid, I loved woodworking and I had tools that I'd collected and would make do woodworking projects at home. So, transitioning into working with my hands making surfboards was a natural for me um and it's a difficult skill to get it really really perfect you know so i love the challenge and i did that for years so i'd be working from like october through june making surfboards in a factory here in la and then leaving and going to the solo do the solo piping from june till the end of september and then go back to the surfboard factory but yeah i did that for probably a good number of years until i finally just thought i'm i I don't want (laughs) what i want to do is piping full time is really what i I wanted to do you built up the contacts the expertise and the 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 great ability and all the instruments that we have been discussing yeah and uh, that's a nice clue right in there you obviously met other a you played with uh, people across here. What uh, came first? Was it the, the groups or was it uh, the film making uh, or the, the, the making of music for films such as Braveheart and Titanic? How did all that occur? Well, the first thing that came before the groups was the recording studio world that mm-hmm. just really i completely stumbled on it in a way um i think the very funny enough and i was just thinking about this before we started our chat today i was thinking about when the very first uh recording i was part of or you know the the first time i stepped into a recording studio as a performer and believe it or not it was actually in in scotland it was in kilsyth and tom johnson who's a great friend of mine I was staying with Tom that summer I think it would have been probably 1988 and he was doing a Tommy Scott recording uh playing the pipes on a Tommy Scott record and he said hey listen they need a couple of pipers for this do you want to do this with me I'd never been in a recording studio before and uh I remember um I was like yeah that sounds great so I was probably playing like three fours or it might have been some original music too we had to play that was like sort of backing tracks that would have been played along with the orchestra you know and then tommy scott would have been singing over the top of it so go to a proper recording studio and it was like wow this is amazing you know um it was like it felt like walking into nasa like command central or something all this massive equipment you know and this recording desk with all these you know buttons and flashing lights and i remember we were doing the recording and um at one point tom kind of 
he looked like he was getting a little bit nervous. I think we were trying to get something just right. And we had a couple of takes that we were doing to try and get it right. And uh, Tom started looking at like a little bit nervous. And I just realized at that time, I was so comfortable. I just felt like I just want to do this, but there's no way to do this. Pipes just don't end up as a recording instrument, you know? Violin players do, fiddle players do, guitar players do, trumpet players do, but not pipers so much, you know? I just thought this is just really like a place where I want to be. And it just so happened when I moved back to America uh, later that year, I think I started getting a couple of phone calls to do some recording projects for people. I didn't know who they were, but they got my name somehow. And from there, it just started to sort of snowball in a way. Um, I believe I was just, I could get the job done quickly. Pipes were in tune. And at that point, uh, I wasn't playing the Illin pipes just yet, I think, at least at that level. But on the Highland pipes, you know, I started getting recording phone calls and things for, uh, you know, some television shows and then films. Um, and, um, I think the very first thing that I did that was really, really big was a few years later. And it was a, a film called The Fugitive with Harrison Ford and uh, Tommy Lee Jones. And um, they had a, a sequence where the, there's a pipe band playing in a parade. I think it was the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Chicago where they actually filmed the pipe band sequence. But I guess I didn't know how this worked at the time, but I think because of the way that the um, legally they were filming a band in an actual parade it was real life but legally weren't allowed to use their sound i think they got permission to use their likeness on camera <clears throat> so then they had to re-record the pipe band so i got a call from a very very big music contractor it would be the fixer basically you know the fixer who finds all the uh you know the the top musicians in la for orchestras and all that for film and television and all that so i got a call by the big biggest fixer in la and uh so the job went well we did the it all came out great and then she started calling me uh for more things um and it was a couple of years i think from there until i got a phone call actually from james horner's uh one of his people uh to plan this film called braveheart which of course at the time and nobody's heard of it yet it wasn't anything publicized about it and got a call it's a mel gibson film and i was like well it's got to be pretty big then i would imagine you know so uh so anyway that's how it led to to doing braveheart um i think actually i met a couple of musicians who work with james horner they were from london and they happened to be in la and they happened to be mutual friends with a friend of mine from ireland one night my friend from ireland who lived in la said hey we're gonna play a few tunes I got some friends over from uh, from from London. They're working on a film, but we're going to play a few tunes. I have a couple of cans of beer. So I met these couple of guys. And uh, yeah, they work with James Horner on 15 or 20 films of his. And I guess they took my name back to him and said, hey, we played with this guy in L.A. It's very good at Ellen Pipes and, you know, Highland Bagpipes. And if you ever need him, you might want to, here's his card, you know, kind of thing. And I'm, that would have been a couple of years later when I got the call to do Braveheart. So uh, that's how it worked and ended up doing five films for James Horner. Eric, did you have an agent at that time or do you do your own stuff? I've, I've never had an agent. I've always just, it's just the calls sort of come to me. I've never had to advertise. I've never had to make any phone calls to people and yeah, it's just it's the all, way it worked, you know? Yeah. I just all straight forward for you then. Yeah. Just, I, yeah. I had uh, in my notes that uh, James Horner was a composer, but it seems to be a lot more than that. Uh, what, what was his position on? Well, he was, he was a film composer main. That's his primary. That would have yeah. been his, that would have been his his whole yeah. Yeah. career. Um, yeah. He was definitely one of the top ones in the world, you know, up there with John Williams, 
yeah. you know, and uh, some of the other big, big names, you know, he would have been one of those top several that would have been making the biggest films that were being made. Um, he had a um, interesting, you know, love for Celtic music, which I found out once I got to know him a bit, you know, I got to know this more on, on Braveheart, you know, as we got into it, uh, he really loved Celtic music. Uh, he loved other kinds of ethnic music too. He liked uh, uh, South American music. He liked the pan pipes, you know, and uh, he liked the, the, the bamboo flutes and whistles that came from South America. He loved the shakuhachi from Japan, the, that flute. And um, so he, he had a huge love for ethnic music and Celtic happened to be one of his most favorite, I, I suppose. But uh, whenever he could fit these things into his film scores, he did. And uh, I think that that was one of his trademark signatures was having orchestra in a sort of traditional Hollywood sense, but then also having things that were just like a flavor, like, what is that? The, the listener would be like, what is that instrument? And something to make something extra unique or special, I think, on screen, but they're hearing it in their ears. And of course, probably nothing bigger than that than the low whistle that was used in, in Titanic, because, you know. It's absolutely atmospheric, and it lends yeah. itself to the image that the people are, are looking at. Yeah. It accentuates the atmosphere of the, the image and take, draws people right into the story, I suppose. Yeah. And towards that end, I, I'm curious to know uh, what was your input as to what tunes would be played. Did they leave that to you or were you dictated to as to exactly what music you should play? And uh, just while I'm talking, I would ask if you could comment on the many takes that uh, you had to do of a tune before it was accepted. Yeah, no, that's a great question. For Braveheart, uh, well, in general, I should say, usually the film composers and as well the TV to the television composers, but definitely the film composers, usually 95% of it has been written by them unless they're borrowing uh, a traditional tune or something that's in the what they call the public domain, which is some, something that's, you know, it's about 100 years old and nobody actually has the actual rights to it anymore. But for the most part, they write their own music. Um, now, when it comes to, as most pipers would know, that could be for better, for worse, because sometimes they're writing things that just don't suit the pipes whatsoever, you know. But what James Horner did for Braveheart was that, and he said this to me on the very first meeting that we had, uh, I went to the film studios. He was working on a film, I think called, it was Casper, the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> Imagine going from that straight to Braveheart, you know, <laughs> two different worlds. But uh, I, I went down to the studios and he was recording orchestra on Casper. And uh, when they finished, uh, he took me, uh, they, they sort of introduced me to him. It was the first time I had met him personally. And he said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. And I may be crucified for this, but he said, I want the pipes. I want to use the Illin pipes. And he said, I know it's a Scottish film. And I know everyone is going to hate me and hate you in Scotland for using Illin pipes on a Scottish film of such significant history, you know, with William Wallace. But he said, the reason I want to do this is because the Highland Pipes are great and they're beautiful and they could work with the orchestra, but I have themes in mind that will go beyond the range of the Highland bagpipe. And I want the instrument to speak like an orchestral instrument. I want it to be as though it was another instrument sitting in with the woodwinds, but it's got this completely different character and flavor to it. And it's got this Celtic tongue, if you will. So I want to use the Illin pipes and uh, I'm going to write, you know, the main theme for the film will be on the Illin pipes and various things. So that's how that really kind of began. Um, in Braveheart, there was two separate. Now, getting to your question about the takes. Well, we did about five days work in Los Angeles uh, where I was just recording by myself. I was listening to backing tracks in the headphones 
all that went great. And then they said, we'd like to know if you're free next month to go to London and record at Abbey Road Studios. We'll be recording the main soundtrack part of the film with the London Symphony Orchestra. So I was over the moon about that, of course, and flew to London. Uh, we recorded at Abbey Road for about two and a half weeks um, with the orchestra. Mel Gibson was with us. He was, of course, being the director, they, they sit there and they babysit the entire production. Um, and uh, I remember my first day, <laughs> my first day with the London Symphony Orchestra. Uh, it was one of the first times I played with a full orchestra. I played with an orchestra wearing, you know, headphones and in my own isolation booth in the studio where if you make a mistake, you're not going to ruin it for the rest of them. But here I was sitting right next to the first violin, you know, in the soloist position right by the conductor, right by James Horner. And I just remember not getting it right two or three times right off the bat and uh, absolutely <laughs> like mortified. And it wasn't so much that I wasn't getting the music right. It was it following the conductor and James Horner really never like to use in the headphones you know there's there's sometimes when you're recording to backing tracks you're listening to a click track and you're hearing a metronome tick 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 and it's very very easy to stay in time with that if you're if you've got any sort yeah. of sense of time with <laughs> yourself but so that's easy but watching a conductor conduct and change tempos and change time signatures i mean looking at a piece of film music there might be four bars of four, four, one bar of two, four, three bars of four, four, back to nine bars of four, four, a bar of five, four. And this is all without, you know, if you miss counting, miss the counting of some of that year, I think that's what I was doing and watching the stick. I didn't grow up like my sister. Now my sister's a concert flutist. She grew up from say fourth year of primary school playing in the school band where there's a conductor and they learn classical musicians tend to learn right from day one when they're children how to follow the baton but in the piping world especially in the pipe band world you know we've got the pipe major's foot and that's yeah, it yeah. you know yeah. so it was a really a different set of skills that i didn't possess in the beginning you know so it took a few times you know to get it right but um getting to the other part of your question with Braveheart there was two points in the film where James Horner had pointed out to me he said listen I'm going to ask you twice during the film to write a counter melody the orchestra is going to be playing the main theme but I'd love it if you could compose a jig or a reel that just improvise something that will go as a counter melody so I did that twice uh, in Braveheart. There was two jigs I wrote that are in the film. Uh, one earlier on, right when Mel Gibson character, William Wallace is sort of gathering his clans and he's getting strength. Uh, they haven't fought the English yet, but there's an assassin who's trying to kill uh, William Wallace early on in the film. And the crazy Irish guy named Stephen ends up killing the assassin. And he says to well, he he says to uh, Mel Gibson character he says I I didn't like him he wasn't right in the head and then a jig starts and that was one of the ones I wrote and the other one was later in the film this is after the Scots have beat the English the Battle of Stirling and uh, now he's a wanted man by the English they're so looking for him and there's a scene two thirds through the film where he's running over the mountaintops I believe it's actually Fort William where they filmed it he's running over the mountaintops man on the run you know and then the orchestra comes in and plays the theme i i'm playing a jig i wrote for that as well and uh so yeah I, I was given some leeway in in the in the film it's not always like that but sometimes they do they give you that did that a leeway a piece of independence that it awarded you in that case did that develop over the years were you given more leeway in, in future films or was it my aim? it's a mixture i don't think that it's a matter of somebody sitting back saying i'd like to hire eric 
let's see, he did something where he, he wrote his own music or improvised on Braveheart. I don't think they think that way. I think it's pretty much... Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a great question, really, because they've got the painting to paint and they, they'll allow you to embellish it slightly, but it, the, the main theme is strictly under their control and they, they want to have keep it that way because it's the yeah. Yeah. that's true i mean that's that's the main part they do yeah. tend to want to keep it the way they want it but they do the the good composers usually will have a bit of a conversation with me before we start before they start writing even and they'll say listen like what's the best key for the pipes or depending on what pipe or if it's the whistle yeah. like what would be the most emotional part of the scale or how could i utilize the most expressive part of the instrument or the illin pipes it's fairly easy it's the, the c natural which on the highland pipes yeah would be what our high g would be but on right. the the c natural uh you've got a lot of flexibility as a player you can really bend into it and make it put the vibrato onto it make it really expressive there's a few notes on the illin pipes that are really really expressive as a player you can mold them as though it was a piece of clay and you can really make it more unique and more expressive and more emotional so uh they do hopefully give you pieces of music that you can do things like that sometimes i'll get a piece of music where you're basically sticking a square peg in a round hole you know they they have an idea that they want pipes whether it be bagpipes or illin pipes they just think that you know but the composers are playing on a keyboard and they've got a they've got a uh, a virtual sample of an illin pipe that you know sounds terrible yeah. that they can play it on the keyboard but because they can play in any part of the piano keyboard they think the pipes can do that and that's usually when you run into problems you know but hopefully you don't run into that too often as as i had a read through uh sort of cb uh select credits and they uh, i noted that you played the, the Great Highland Bagpipe quite a lot, but it was mostly the Olin Pipes whistles eh, because of eh, what we've just been discussing there just now. But when you did play, uh, or you do play the, the Great Highland Bagpipe, what key are you using the chanter? Is it the A chanter? What is it? Much of the time, yeah, it would be the A chanter that I've modified to play in A. It's just an old, old chanter. You know, I've had a few. Um, actually, I've had a pretty good one from McCallum Bagpipes, uh, and they've made a newer one since I've uh, got, I think I got one of the original prototypes. Um, hard to read. That's the only thing. They're hard to get a good read to, to see. I think it's gotten easier now, you know. But uh, I had this old chanter that a good friend of mine in L.A. gave me, um, and it was probably earlier part of the 20th century. And, uh, I remember having to, uh, figure out how to get this thing, you know, how to read it. And I remember speaking to Doogie Pincock and Doogie was playing in a with, you know, when he was with the battlefield band and with different projects. And he kind of said, well, go to George Lumsden. George is making, he can make a longer read that might suit it. He said, you might run into problems with the the double toning f which can happen um but anyway george made me a set of a few chanter reads and i was able to kind of get going on an a chanter then and then i have a chanter in the key of b flat concert so that's not too difficult to get sorted and that is right in at concert pitch with the orchestra and then of course there's times when yeah i would say mostly it would be on the a or the b flat chanter but you know, there's still times where they just want the Highland bagpipes. I'm not playing with the orchestra. They, you're in a film and you're playing on your own, or I'm doubling myself to sound like a, a small pipe band or multi-tracking several instances of myself on top. So it sounds like a band. And usually that I can just use the, you know, my, my yeah. proper set of yeah, pipes, cool. you know? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I understand you're playing a set of McCallum bagpipes. Yeah, I do. I um, I have two very, very beautiful sets of old Henderson drones, 1906 and 1912, mm -hmm. both of which I used when I was competing and 
going around the games and open Inverness and stuff at Scott in Scotland. Um, but yeah, Kenny McLeod gave me a set of pipes years ago. Um, I think they were the clasp model, which I don't think they make anymore, but, uh, was flying around the world with a, a set of 1906 Henderson's modified to, you know, to play in the key of a, and, uh, I remember talking to Kenny one day in Scotland and he said, you shouldn't be flying around the world with a set of pipes like that, you know? let me get you a set. And so he got me a set, uh, that I could read them up, you know, in the key of a, um, I think, uh, Ronnie McShannon made me some longer, easy drones. Uh, this is going back a long time. This is going back into the nineties, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I got a set. Yeah. So I had a, I have a beautiful set of McCallum pipes that are, they just live in the key of, of a, um, I can swap in the B flat channer and switch the drone reads out and put in some yeah. other ones that I could be right in B flat, but they're just beautiful. I mean, I was able, I was able to like, um, get them to a point where they sound the quality of sound, I think would make me as happy as my Henderson set. I mean, of course there's a difference of course, but still make it to where I, I just couldn't, I think with all these years of playing pipes as any piper would be, you can't live with a poorly sounding pipe. I mean, I don't mean just not in no. tune, but I mean a reed that doesn't have that kind of buzz or a, a channery that doesn't have that kind of pop that we all love, you know? So it doesn't matter what pipe it is. If it's small pipes or the inland pipes, it's got to have that quality to it where you're just like, makes me happy, you know, makes you happy as a player. And then if you know, if it's making you happy and it's in tune, it's going to make, and you know, other people happy. So just when you're on about bagpipes, uh, and I know that you won the Dunvegan a uh, medal at mm -hmm. one point, a uh, in Sky. Uh, yeah. It was the Dunvegan medal and at the games rather than the Silver Chanter, wasn't it? No, not the Silver Chanter. That was no. The that's Silver usually medal. yeah. That's can, can you remember what you played and? What pipes he played? Yes, um, I think it was nineteen ninety. I think possibly when I won the Dunvegan Medal, I was playing my nineteen twelve Henderson yeah. drones, playing a nail chanter, right. McAllister Reed, uh -huh. or sheepskin bag. The whole Kane reads the old the business, you know, like as we and did. That perfect yeah. cue. Eh? For me to uh, point out to the audience now that you've moved away from sheepskin, no doubt. You're on Gore-Tex plastic uh, drone reeds. You've got the more modern uh, uh, bagpipe and everything else. So uh, the whole thing's turned around in a, a big circle for you that you're, you're not playing a traditional uh, bagpipe that like you did in 1990, but you're playing something you can readily take out a case and know that it'll work because it's a Gore-Tex bag. Yeah. You've done away with all the variables that uh, come in with cane reed, deep skin and everything else. And what you want is a ready-made instrument that in two or three minutes you can get going and just go into a studio and record. Yeah, you know, that's a great point right there, is that yeah. in my world, I keep seven sets of bagpipes going at all times and a few extra chanters here and there. Uh, I might not get to my Highland pipes as much as I would have, where I would have been playing every single day. I play a lot, but you know, it's just my work dictates where my focus is. And, uh, so, and even on the small pipes, sometimes I'm not getting to, you know, I've got an A chanter on the set of Hamish Moore small. He made, I got the combo set that he used to make, which was an A and a D chanter. You could swap them out and switch the drones around and play in D or play in A. Um, so, you know, sometimes I don't get to the D, the little D chanter on the small pipes very often anymore, but I keep it going. And if I have to pop it in, it it's bang on in tune, you know? So, yeah, I think removing the variables is something that um, is important for me. I, I just don't, I couldn't have, you know, four sheepskin bags on the other sets of pipes. I just wouldn't get to them uh, to keep them maintained as as I would have when I was younger, you know, just playing one or two sets of pipes. Um, 
in saying that, I definitely miss the sound of the sheepskin bag, the cane reeds, you know, the whole thing. Um, and I have a gym bag, sheepskin bag that's been sitting in my <laughs> shelf for like a couple of years. Uh, one day, I keep thinking one day I'm going to tie it in and I've got some nice cane right. drone reeds. I'm going to put them all in again, but it's just a matter of... It, when you're it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, time. how much time is in a day, you know? I have to say, I, I just do. I prefer that sound. I love that sound, you know, and I'll go yeah. back to Scotland. I'll pop into Kenny McLeod shop, McCallum bagpipes and catch up my, with my old pals there. One of my best friends uh, for years is uh, Rory Grossert. And uh, yeah. I'll go up to Rory's uh, reed making room there, you know, and and he'll blow up his pipes and sheepskin bag and cane reeds. And it just sounds amazing, you know, it just sounds Boy, incredible. Yeah. Just, oh, just, it fun. just sounds like, sounds like what we know, you know, yes. but, um, in, but in saying that, I mean, if I'm on stage performing at a concert, there's oftentimes I'll have all three of my pipes and whistles I'll have Highland bagpipes, small pipes and Illin pipes on stage. And I might play the Highland pipes on the first couple of numbers at the beginning of the show. And I've got them tuned so that I know where they're going to be. But I might be on the whistle of the Illin pipes for another five or six numbers, and I'm not going back to pick up the Highland pipes for maybe 30 minutes. I've got to be able to pick that set of pipes up, and they need to be still bang on in tune. Not just in tune with themselves, with the drones and the chanter, but they have to be in tune with the band. You know, and there's just, I think that's the level of when you're a professional musician like a gigging musician where you're out and about and you're playing all over the world in different climates, hot weather, cold weather, dry weather, wet weather. And it, you're, there's, you kind of don't have any excuses. You just have to prepare your world so that it's all bang on in tune at any time. You know, you just, you know, as they say, you know, it, you know, uh, a craftsman is only as good as his tools. You know, you can't blame yeah. your tools either. Right. So. He went uh, around the world for a year or two with Ruben Blades, of course. I, uh, Ruben Blades. Yeah, yeah. So that was interesting. I was um, that would have been uh, early two thousands, and uh, I guess my name would be well, pretty well known around the world uh, of of you know the music world and the music industry and the film and television industry, you know, as well as in our like smaller world, the piping world, but most of the world wouldn't know the piping world. If they want to find me, they wouldn't necessarily know anything that I was part of in my years in Scotland and pipe bands and solo, that, that wouldn't be anything they would know. It would just be probably from reputation, word of mouth, um, maybe the internet, seeing my name here and there. But anyway, Ruben Blades is a Hollywood actor, but more so a very famous latin musician uh he it's it's salsa music which he yeah. plays and he would be probably one of the world's most famous uh salsa musicians like like a basically a rock star in the world of salsa music from the 1970s all the way through to the present day he was making an album at the time called mundo which in spanish means world he was making a salsa record, but with world music influences on it. And he wanted bagpipes and he wanted Illin pipes. So he didn't necessarily know the difference, of course, like many, you know, musicians who don't come from our world. They don't know what the difference of the Illin pipes, the whistles and the, and the Highland pipes. But uh, he did. We met and I took a look at the music he wanted to use and it involved Highland pipes, whistles, and Illin pipes, everything I play, you know. So uh, I recorded on the album. Um, we recorded it down in Costa Rica in Central America, which was exciting. Uh, yeah. And then the, the album went on to win the Grammy that year, or the following year, for Best World Music Album. And he wanted to perform the uh, album live around the world. So he approached me and said, would you be able to do that? could you travel with the band? And so he was the only like white guy, you know, playing Illin pipes and, you know, Highland pipes um, with a whole band of about, I think it was about 12 musicians 
that were all from Latin America, you know, playing guitars and drums and bass guitar and keyboards. And, you know, uh, it was phenomenal, you know, experience. So we went all over South America, all over Central America, North America, um, performing the album for two years. So um, I got a, you know, I learned how to, <laughs> I learned, a, it was like, I felt like a kindergartner because this was the kind of music I had no idea about the rhythms, about the traditions, their traditional music, the way the rhythms are played and felt. But it was really, it was tremendous. It was a great opportunity. It will just be atrociously difficult as well for you as a piper to read in another uh, stratosphere or something, you know? Yeah, you know, we feel, we feel the beat and we feel the rhythm as pipers in a kind of unique way, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially solo pipers, as you would know, you know? Solo pipers are really pulling back on the back end of the beat and really expressing in the phrasing, especially in March Strispe playing, you know, we're really accentuating the phrase. We're stringing it all together to be a musical thing, of course, a, a, a beautiful piece of music, but we have our own unique way of laying on the back end of the beat. Yes. But in there, in the world of, I suppose in classical music and in following a conductor, the orchestras tend to do the same thing. They tend to play when the conductor is giving the downbeat, the orchestra is definitely on the back end of that. It's just the style that they do. Um, it was explained to me by one of James Horner's London musicians, uh, when the ethnic guys, he, he said, no, I won't use the word he said, but he basically said, <laughs> no bugger wants to be the first one to the beat in the orchestra because then everyone knows it was you, you know? So everybody's afraid to be the first one to the, to, to beat the first one to the beat. But, you know, in, in the pop music world and, you know, whether it be, you know, pop music, rock music, whatever, you know, they're right on the beat with you know the the rhythmic instruments and that was the thing with the with the salsa music too that you know not only were their rhythms different um they just were locked in there was polyrhythms a main rhythm and other counter rhythms working all together and for all that to work it's got to be perfectly metrically played to, with feeling as well but these guys have been doing it their whole life and here comes you know here comes this piper you know that but you know it was great it was um i yeah I, I adapted well you just you know when you are a recording musician you just learn to work quick on your feet because they could throw anything at you they can ask you to improvise something on a record you might be playing yeah. on an album they have no music for you at all and they just say right well we'll just play it from the top just play and you're thinking i haven't even heard this yet yeah but that's the world that they're in. If a session guitar player, a top guitar player, they bring him in, he's not going to ever even hear the piece of music. They're going to start the tape rolling and he's just going to play some amazing solo, guitar solo without ever hearing it, you know? So it's like, you know, we're a little bit up against that from where we come from as pipers, you know, but you just have to learn to work quickly. But uh, it's funny. Uh because I'd, another wee thing written down here, uh, but uh, astonishing amount of work over the years in films, live concerts, recording sessions, television, D DVD and uh, video. What do you enjoy the most? And what's the most difficult? Hmm. I like it all. I mean, I love film. Film work um, is just, I mean, it, it ends up on the big screen, you know, and that, uh, well, at least it used to, right? I mean, everything's, we watch everything on the telly now, but, you know, it is still going out to the cinema and there's something pretty magical about that. And that whole process is a bigger process and it takes longer. Um, there's more time to get everything just right. You know, you might record something or the composer might have something that he's got the orchestra they've recorded it, I've done my bits. And then the director of the film or the producer two weeks later says, oh, we want to change something. And then you're called back in again to do some kind of revision or edit or something. But uh, in the world of um, television, it moves quicker. They just have shorter deadlines. 
things move quick. Record albums, fairly quick as well. Um, I'd say those would be the more creative type of things for me in a way uh, that some most many times when you're coming in to play on a pop star's record or anybody's record, unless they have a specific melody for you, they just say, well, just do what you do. Just play, you know? Yeah. So you're very much under the microscope, you know? So that's where I think when you're doing it all the time, I could just come up with a melody or improvise a passage over some guitar chords or orchestra or something that I maybe never heard before. But I, I was just, when you're doing it all the time, you, you're kind of used to it. You're used to being put in the hot seat and they just expect you to deliver. It's like, there's no excuse like, oh, well, I need a few more cracks at it. They just, they want you to get it the first, second or third take, you know? Uh, uh, so that's difficult. Takes at it. You want everybody to be on song just immediately and that's it. That's, yeah, I mean, they're, that's yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the world they're used to. They're used yeah. to bringing in a keyboard player, a piano player that can just read anything and play it down perfectly, you know, from the first get go. Uh, but I think probably um, in answer to your question, the most difficult would probably be um, uh, either making the instrument like on a film score or a television score, having to make the instrument either do something that it really doesn't want to do or play way up in the register where it's tuning gets a bit, especially on the inland pipes can get a bit dodgy up there or play something on the whistle, a very top or with long passages where there's no place to take a, a breath, or no room for air. All that stuff is pretty tricky, you know, um, but I think when you're brought in to do something where you've got to make it all up, you've got to improvise everything and basically come up with the parts as they, they call it. You just come up with your own part that, you know, you're under the microscope because you're out there in the recording floor in the studio in a chair, oftentimes by yourself or maybe with the whole band. And there's all these faces looking at you through the glass uh, inside the control room, just expecting you to get it perfect every time, you know, uh, or at least on the first time and then they can move on, you know. So, yeah, it's um, it's challenging. Definitely not for everybody. That uh, covers a composing question from earlier. It's a, a, an adaption, really, than, uh, and it's instant, uh, just a uh, music making, uh, rather than sitting down watching TV with a practice chanter, which you started <laughs> your earlier life. And yeah. uh, just to conclude, uh, we've got the Battlefield Band that you played with all these years ago in the group. And yep. uh, now you've got your own group, Bad Haggis, and uh, there'll be quite a difference in the type of music played, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Bad Haggis has been around a long time now. We've just, this is our 25th year. Um, we don't play as much, but we were very, very active, you know, in the, in the early part of the, the band's career when everybody's writing music and we're all gung-ho, you know, and everybody's excited about a new project. Um, but uh, yeah, it's different. Uh, I was a guest player for the Battlefield Band just for a, a couple of US legs of a tour. Alan, Mc, uh, sorry, it was Ian McDonald was the piper and he broke his hand right before the tour started. And so in a panic, Ian phoned me and the band phoned me. And I think Doogie Pincock, no, was it Duncan McGilvery went out and did yeah. the first few dates that I couldn't do and covered for for Ian and then I flew out and Duncan flew home back to Scotland and I took over um but it was great fun you know uh just great fun to to do that it was a band that I loved when I was younger and had their records and you know yeah. they've been going forever as well you know it's just it's like being part of a tradition when you get to play with a band like that they've been on the go for ages yeah Bad Haggis would definitely be more of uh, a where I wanted to experiment with what my instruments can do by taking them out of the traditional world, but still retaining the essence of what they do, mm -hmm. but put them into another 
format or into different genres of music like rock or world music or jazz or you know or latin rhythms or african rhythms played underneath and the sort of chassis of the band would have been uh rock jazz instrumentation it would have been a drum kit you know bass guitar electric bass electric and acoustic guitars their vocals in there as well you know but putting the the pipes and the whistles in Mo uh, mainly we wrote original music for you know the piece of music we were writing there were adaptations where i'd bring in a set of reels or jigs and you know we would uh we would make our own version of a, a set of jigs or reels you know but <laughs> yeah. refreshing but it lets yourself no longer under the control of other people who are making movies etc you're, you're now you've got your bad haggis you make your own music and that'll be very enjoyable and give you an absolute freedom to go where you want to go with your music. And I assume that uh, you've got the same musicians, or do you bring in uh, various different musicians depending where the gig is? Well, we've got the core founding members of the band, which would be the yeah. guitar player, the bass player, who's also the vocalist, and myself. The three of us started the band with this crazy vision I had to take the pipes and put them in another yeah. another universe, I suppose. Um, but yeah, we've we do bring in other musicians we, for one album. We brought in Latin musicians and we had percussionists. Uh, another thing we brought in some African musicians. And uh, so, yeah, we do we do change it up a bit. Um, you know, it's a good point you made about where it's a bit of freedom from the film work and all that. You know, I think for me that's exactly what it was was kind of making this group from scratch out of my influences of music my musical influences but doing something different because playing in the solo piping playing in pipe bands it's a pretty structured thing you're playing either traditional old traditional music in p brick and light music or you're in pipe bands where you're playing a mixture of traditional music and maybe modern compositions written by you know different composers and uh, and that's wonderful. I love that. Um, that is similar to working on the confines of a, of a film score. You're playing somebody else's music, yeah, or you're playing somebody who's telling you how they want it to be, which is under their vision, which is all great as well. But when forming my own band, and and I mean to be honest, Bad Haggis is definitely we we definitely went, you know. We didn't just stay in a safe place musically. We definitely pushed the boundaries of things. Um, and, uh, you know, that was that was a lot of freedom. That was a lot of freedom because I felt like the instruments and it could work for my compositions because I suppose I can, I guess people would say this as well. I compose in a certain way and it's, I don't sit down to think about composing a tune that's going to be different than say what another, you know, colleague would write on the Highland Pipes or, something that would be written in the Irish music world. However, it comes out of me is just how it comes out. That's just the way my brain works. If, if in, you know, walking the plank, if the phrase I was humming in my head sounded great. And once I went down to look at it on paper, there was a bar of two, four and a bar of three, four or back to two, four and two, four, two, four, three, four. It wasn't that I was trying to be clever. It was just, that's how I sung it in my head. And then it's like, whoops, uh, well, that's just the way it is. It's, you know, so it was freedom, really, I think, in having the band. So uh, where are we going in the future uh, uh, with your music and your general, whatever? Well, I actually have a brand new project that I've just started. Um, I mean, answer to that question, I'm still doing film work, um, still doing television. We're just wrapping up. In fact, last night I was recording uh, the final notes, bits of music for a television series I've been on for the last seven seasons called Outlander, which is some of it was filmed in Scotland. And of course there's Scottish themes in there. Um, Outlander has been something I've been on for seven seasons. And just recently I did the new Lord of the Rings uh, television series for Amazon. Season two will be coming out later i think it'll be probably the beginning of next year 
just did a film called Dungeons and Dragons. That was a film, a big theatrical release. Um, so yeah, still busy with that, but um, back to my own project thing. I got a brand new project that's called Celtic Hollywood and it, it's a bit of a silly name in a way for people in Scotland and Ireland because the word Celtic is sort of, you know, it's it's a bit generic, you know, but I mean, if you're trying to, to interest uh, people in Asia or other countries, if I was to say something about Scottish traditional music, they, they would get it or they wouldn't get it. But anyway, uh, it's a new project. It's called Celtic Hollywood and it's actually a revisiting of all the kind of big themes that I did, whether it would have been on film, film works, film soundtrack, television soundtrack, or uh, we even have, there's something from a record I did for Mike Oldfield for Tubular Bells that I played on many years ago. So um, what I'm doing in this film, it's basically a, I'm, I'm sorry, not film. This project is a, uh, it's basically a kind of a musical, retrospective of my life in a way it's um stuff from you know the kind of solos i did in braveheart titanic outlander uh tubular bells uh lord of the rings uh, a bunch of stuff like that uh mixed in with a few sets of jigs and reels in there because that's part of my history as well is the traditional music you know so it's it's an ensemble that is kind of uh, one part classical musicians and one part folk musicians. Um, we've got a great fiddle player who's uh, wonderful and a great guitar player, but then we've got a cello and we've got piano and, and keyboards and we've got viola. So it's kind of like a kind of like a string chamber string ensemble that's kind of Celtic in a way. And so uh, we've just getting underway right now with that. And um, so hopefully be hopefully coming to Scotland at some point. So a, will it be a, a show, a live show or a video or whatever? It's a live show. It's a live concert performance. Right. Uh, but uh -huh. but the um, what we're designing video to be also played uh, on the backdrop. So it'll be a multimedia right. thing. Uh -huh. uh, it's tricky with the film studios to try and get the actual footage because they they don't want to let it go for right. anything anything reasonable that we could ever afford, you know. But it just depends what it is, and um, but uh, but there is other imagery that we're using in in in, in things, and, and we can use certain clips uh, from the films. It just we we can't just show a whole big thing of Mel Gibson fighting the English and Braveheart without paying thousands of dollars every time we perform it. So it's too bad. I wish it, I wish we could, but, uh, right. but in any case, it's going to be sort of a multimedia concert performance. Right. Well, we could talk here all day and to next uh, couple of days and still keep going and never get to the end. But unfortunately, we've got to draw the curtain somewhere. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I thought it was going to manage about 20 minutes. And it's about, I don't know, what is it, about an hour and a half? Or an oh, hour my goodness. Uh, and you've been very patient with me. And thanks very much. Appreciate it. Alan, yeah, thank you. I um, really appreciate it. I, great questions. Um, I, I've done a lot of interviews, but sometimes the questions don't get right in there, you know, and you had some really good ones um, that... Uh, you know, not are nor not normally asked. Um, but anyway, thank you. And and I, I looked at your I looked at some of your videos and um, I looked at the list and I'm honored to be part of uh, some of the colleagues or all of the colleagues in there are some really big names. So I really appreciate it uh, with my my wife now, Erica. Uh, we've been together since 2005, but we only just got married uh, in 2017. Yeah, yeah. And we actually got married up in Glenfinnan, uh, surprisingly uh, enough. She'd never been to Scotland. And um, at some point when we were dating, I think it was, we were together for uh, five or six years. And I brought her to Scotland. I was actually performing in London at the Albert Hall. We were doing a Titanic um, 3D. It was the world premiere of the 3D version of Titanic at the Albert Hall. So. I brought her with me and after London was finished, um, I'd said, well, you never, you got to see Scotland. You got to go to Scotland. She'd right. only been to London. So I took her up and she met everybody. She met Kenny and, and, uh, 
you know, all my, my pals, Tom Johnson and Rory and Hi. everybody. But so uh, we were in Edinburgh for a few days. We were in Glasgow for a few days. And I said, I'm going to take you to the Highlands. And we were, I was going to take her to the Isle of Skye. And on the way up there, the weather started getting bad. And we were just went through Fort William and it was just starting to snow and it was sort of late in the day and we hadn't anything booked. So we we're coming through just about to get to Glen Finn and, and I said, you know, we should maybe sort out some digs tonight here because the weather's, you know, we just want to not be on the road and we might not be crossing tonight, you know. So anyway, um, we popped into Glen Finn House Hotel there, which I've been at many times. I've been in it. I know it. Yep. Because the and Highland chapel, Games. The chapel, the old chapel just along the road from it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, the Highland Games were there, you know, the Glen Finn and Highland Games. And, all, you know, usually the, the Pipers would go to the hotel for a few drams after, you know, the games. So I knew it well. Um, but uh, we popped in for a cup of tea and try and sort out some digs, make some phone calls, try and get some like a B and B somewhere, maybe up in Malig or Arasag or something. So there's a fire roaring this late afternoon, the fire roaring. There's a dog laying in front of the fire, the inside the hotel. There's the snows just starting to come down. The people are reading books, having dram, a dram. My wife had never seen anything like that. She's like, this is amazing. You think there's any chance we could stay here? And I spoke to the, uh, to the owners and there was one room left. We stayed there, we had a lovely meal. The chef was great and had a great night. So she said to me at some point, which I do not remember, if we ever get married, I wanna get married here. And I, I probably okay. thought, oh, right, 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 you know, in one ear and out the other. And then, you know, six years later when we got engaged to be married, she brought that up and she said, do you remember what I said if we ever get married? It's Glen Finn, and I went, oh, my God, I forgot all about that. Well, we ended up getting married there, and uh, we got married in the, in, the, in the chapel right next door. You know, I, I, was up, I, I do a lot of hill walking over the years, and the same group since 1991. But I'm 80 now, but old guys were still all, yeah. Yeah. The day, and uh, the late district were there a few weeks ago. But the were walking in Glen Finn, it was a particularly difficult walk. And uh, the next day we took that boat up Loch Shiel. You mm -hmm. know, the, the boat that does a Loch Shiel, fantastic, yeah. but, you know. And we went into the chapel and I took some photographs, actually, I still got photographs, but inside the chapel. And I was very, very old and it was, it looked as if it was still in the same conditions that it was built about several hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the decor and all. But uh, very atmospheric, beautiful. Eh? Not a big place, a small chapel. Eh? So it'd be a nice place for a wedding. Eh? It really is beautiful. Yeah, you know, it was a magical kind of thing. I mean, it wasn't easy to put together because we were bringing family and friends we'd invited from the States to come all the way over. And then, of course, I invited a heap of friends from Scotland and Ireland that came over. Um, it kind of turned into this magical trip because we coincided with, I was doing a special concert at the Albert Hall, uh, which was called uh, James Horner, A Life in Music. And it was a tribute, it was two years after he was killed in the plane crash. It was in 2017. Mm. So it was a whole, uh, retrospective of just excerpts from his biggest films, Titanic, Braveheart, Avatar, you know, mm. Field of Dreams and all these films. And what they had done is the uh, film company had gotten interviews with all the directors. Ron Howard spoke about Apollo 13 and Steven Spielberg spoke about something and Mel Gibson spoke about Braveheart. Um, anyway, so it was a wonderful uh, concert, but they had the the film, you know, the film screen behind it, and they showed these interviews, and then we would launch into Avatar or Braveheart and do an excerpt with the full orchestra. Um, and so it was like, so anyway, all the guests that came over from the States, I got them tickets. So 
that was the beginning of their trip. They had a few days in London, sightseeing, go to the concert of the Albert Hall, then up to Scotland. And most of them had never been to Scotland. And we stayed in Edinburgh for a few days, did whiskey tasting and a, a ladies' tea, high tea for the ladies, you know. And then we went and Gla- went to Glasgow. And then we uh, had the wedding in Glenfinnan. And, uh, you know, so Roddy McLeod played my bride down the aisle. Uh, you know, uh, Rory Grossard, Kenny McLeod, Tom Johnson all played uh, played us out at the very end, you know, and uh, it was just, Alan McDonald played a beautiful piece, uh, a Gaelic piece on the small pipes in the middle of the ceremony. And a singer from Ireland, Nuala Kennedy, sang a beautiful piece. And it was wonderful, you know, so we all Aren't were you, all man? there and yeah, we're all there and kind of stay, everyone was staying in Glenfinnan and then uh, you know, we had a serious good <laughs> evening shall i say i think we, i think i heard the last people to go to bed were at 5 a.m and they drank them out of whiskey you know at the, hey, at the hotel you know uh, anyway. well good health to uh, and thank you to all of you and it's been wonderful speaking to you eric i've thoroughly enjoyed it it's one of the best interviews ever uh, thank you alan thanks for your time good my, my pleasure look forward to seeing you next time i'm over Look forward to that also. All right. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye now. Cheers. Bye-bye.